Can yeah, you see it? Looks good. We can see it full screen. Can you, just can you also see my mouse? Yes, we can. Okay, good. So, um, hello everybody. I am Alfredo Riotti. I am a PhD student at the uh, APFL in Lausanne, Switzerland. And I'm going to talk to you about this recent work that we published last year, last summer, about how to use neural network to improve uh, effective field theory sensitivity. This work we did it together with uh, C.U. Chen, Giuliano Panico, and Andrea Wutzer. So let's start from the motivations. So as we have already seen several times today with all the previous talks, we have a huge variety of possible measurements that we can do at LHC. For example, we can study physics at IPT, we can study the Higgs coupling, the Higgs uh, distributions, and so on. And we have also seen that new physics, even if you work just at a model independent level, so using the Santa model effective field theory approach, the new physics can enter in all this measurement in a huge amount of, uh, in, a, in a large amount of ways. So our job as theorists is to design an effective and systematic data analysis technique that uh, is uh, supposed to maximize the sensitivity on these EFT parameters. So what do I mean by effective and systematic? Effective means that it should be able to extract the maximum possible amount of information from the data. And systematic meaning that the same uh, kind of technique that we use for study to study one of these processes should be able to be used for um, all the other processes without changing the technique. So let's start from this. So this is what we usually do as theories. We have our theory that for this talk will be the standard model effective field theory Lagrangian. So we have the usual standard model Lagrangian plus the dimension six operators together with their Wilson coefficients. And from this Lagrangian, we extract some predictions that can be either total cross sections as function of this new physics parameter or probability distributions. These probability distributions are basically differential cross sections and they are function, they are differential in all these variables that I'm calling X that are the observables that you can actually measure in uh, real experiments. Now, this is in the ideal world, but what is usually done in practice is uh, some simplified prediction, meaning that instead of working at the fully differential level, we are working in a bind way. So we compute this cross section in some bins, binning in some subset of these measurable observables. And we see, yeah, the, the, we compute the cross section in these pins as a function of the Wilson coefficients. Now it's clear that in doing this approach, we are losing some information. And I will show later in the presentation one example in which this loss of information you is actually quite big. Sorry, I can I can hear you. Is that a problem? I can hear you. Sarah, I'm sorry, Sarah, can, can you hear me? That's an issue. I think you can go ahead. It's maybe just can that drop thing out. So, uh, so I'm sorry, I'm really not sure what happened. We can hear you, yes. Okay, so, sorry. Yeah, so I was saying that doing this bin the uh, prediction can can lose some information. And so what we should aim to do is to try to use the fully differential prediction P of X given theta. And this function P of X should be known as, as, um, as well as possible as a function of all the observable variables X and the new physics parameter theta. Now, the first question is, do we know what is this function? So, if we look at, uh, uh, if we take Monte Carlo generators, we know that we can generate some events that are distributed according to this uh, P of X given theta. But the Monte Carlo generator itself doesn't, does not have access to this, uh, to the explicit form of the function. Because the way that the generator works is that first, there is a first sample of some, let's call them partonic level variable, Z part, that are computed starting from this probability P of z part given theta, that is what you basically compute from Feynman diagrams. But then there is an additional step afterwards in which event by event, these partonic level variables are transformed 
to the actually physical observable X. And schematically, it looks something like this. You have that the function that we are interested in, this probability of X, is some complicated convolution of what the Monte Carlo knows times this, uh, let's say, conversion uh, function. And the key point that, we, that I'm trying to stress is that these parton level observables are usually very far from what is actually measured because this Z part can contain, for example, information over uh, about invisible particles that you, integrate, that you need to integrate over, actually in order effects and so on. And the situation gets even worse once you include the effects like showering, atomization, the interaction with the detector. And in this case, the formula looks uh, something even more scary like this. There are ways to try to approximate this function p of x given theta. One way is, for example, the matrix element method that you can read about in uh, these papers here. And the idea here is that you start from the parton level uh, uh, prediction, as the Monte Carlo generator was doing. And then you add some transfer function that you convolute with the parton level prediction. And this transfer function will convert these uh, unobservable parton level uh, variables to what you actually observe. But the problem with this kind of approaches is that this transfer function need to be uh, explicitly modeled phenomenologically. And also case by case, you need to design from scratch this kind of uh, transfer functions. For example, even if you just study the same process at leading order or next leading order, the transfer function that you need uh, are different. Also, this is uh, this kind of method is not systematically improvable, meaning that you need to model the best that you can this kind of function, but you have no way of knowing whether your approximation is good or not. So what? We are studying in our paper and what was initially proposed by Bremer and collaborators in this paper here is to approximate this function P of X given theta through neural networks. The idea is that you learn this function with a learning, with a training algorithm, starting from Monte Carlo data. The nice thing about this is that this kind of training only relies on X, so only relies on variables that you can actually measure and observe. The output of this kind of uh, procedure will be a fully differential function that will be fully differential on all the observable x, will be quick to evaluate, and it can be obtained even with a relatively small amount of Monte Carlo points. There is no need of modeling any transfer function to approximate uh, the detector or showering or whatever you want. And the best feature about this kind of approach is that it is universal, meaning that the same approach works for whatever physical process we are trying to study. And it's systematically improvable, meaning that if you're not satisfied with the level of your approximation of this P of X function, it's clear what you have to do. You have to enlarge your training set, you have to make the neural network more complex and so on. So I will give you now an example on how these kind of trainings work. The simplest sample is what we call the simple classifier. So what you do is you consider a fixed value for this uh, Wilson coefficient theta that we call theta bar. And I will show you that uh, we can learn through training a neural network, the PDF ratio between the uh, probability of X given this theta bar with respect to the probability of uh, a reference value that we take to be theta equal zero. So the standard model distribution. So what you do is you build a training function, a training sample like this. So this will be some pairs of points that will be the kinematic features that you're interested in, this xi, and then a label that it's either zero or one, depending on whether these x are generated starting from the distribution, the standard model distribution on this theta bar distribution. What you do then is you build this loss function that is basically the mean squared error between the neural network output and these uh, target variables here. And what the, training what the training algorithm does is it tries to minimize numerically this loss function here with respect to these Ws. These Ws are the thousands of pre free parameters that the neural network has. So to see what is the output of these kind of training algorithms, 
we can go into the infinite training sample limit and you can see that this uh, kind of sum becomes an integral over the two distribution. So the standard model here on the left and the uh, theta bar on the right of this kind of mean squared error. If you take the functional derivative of this loss, you find what is the minimum of this loss. And you can see that this uh, loss is minimized for uh, the neural network is uh, equal to this ratio of probabilities that then you can invert in this way to find the PDF ratio between the theta bar hypothesis and the zero. And so the standard model hypothesis. Now, this kind of approach has some drawbacks, meaning that we have fixed theta bar. So we don't have the dependence of the PDF ratio as a function of theta. And so if you want to use it as a function of theta, you should train it for every value of theta that you might, might be interested in. And also the target, meaning the, the physical region we are usually interested in, is the one in which the deviation, the, 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 how do you say it? the deviation between the BSM and the standard model are quite small. And in this region, training with a finite amount of points is actually less, is, is less effective. So the idea that we had for our paper is to also use theta as a training input. But we don't give theta as a training input to the neural network. But what we do is something slightly more complicated. And we are forcing the output of the training algorithm to be a quadratic function of theta. Why do we do this? So we know from physical consideration that the difference of cross-section in the BSM hypothesis is going to be a positive and quadratic function of this Wilson coefficient theta. So what we do is we take the loss function as in the previous slide, but now instead of the neural net, the simply neural network here, we put this combination here of two neural networks. So this one here is the most general polynomial that is quadratic in theta that you can write, and it's also positive. And you can see that the coefficient of the, basically the linear and quadratic terms are given by two neural networks. If you do this replacement on this loss, you can show that the training algorithm converge, converges to the true PDF ratio as a function of all the observable x and theta. Why is this uh, important? This is important because now the two neural networks are theta independent. And so what it means is that you can train your neural network for large values of theta, so for values for which the BSM and Santa model distribution are noticeably different. And then you can uh, interpolate and use this function as a function of theta also to study the small theta region because the training algorithm is basically fitting this parabola here. So as an application of this kind of methodology, we have studied the WC production at uh, LHC in actually high luminosity LHC. So we have two protons going into WZ that then decay into four leptons. This is a really interesting process for studying BSM physics. You can read these two papers here if you want more details. The idea is that there's these two operators, O3, phi Q, and OW, that enter uh, this process in a way that grows with energy. So if you look at the kinematic of this process, we can identify six independent and discriminated variables that are S hat, so the center of mass energy of this collision, and five angles that are the angles of the boson with the beam angle and the four decays angles for two for each of the bosons. So why do we want to measure all these angles? The reason is that the BSM and Santa model contribute to different helicities production for the W and the Z. For example, the standard model contributes mainly to the production of two longitudinals or two opposite helicities transverse diboson bosons, while this uh, first operator contributes to only longitudinal production, and these OW operators contributes to same sign helicity for transverse bosons. If you integrate over the decay angles of the bosons, you are losing this helicity information here. And this is particularly dramatic for this OW operator for which the helicity combination does not enter in the standard model. And if you integrate over the angles, basically you are killing the interference term between standard model and new physics. 
And here in these plots, you can see, for example, that uh, if you look at one of these uh, phi angles for the decay, the standard model is a flat distribution while there is this uh, interference uh, pattern once you turn on the, this OW operator. This, this kind of interference here is linear in uh, the coefficient GW, so the width of coefficient for this OW operator, but if you integrate over, over, the, over all the angles, basically what you're left with is only the quadratic term, and so you're losing a lot of sensitivity on this operator. So the first thing we did is that we wanted to quantify whether this method is uh, working or not, whether this method is effective or not. So what we did is we built our own little Monte Carlo that is implementing an approximate version of the leading order process that I just talked about. Approximate meaning that uh, we are able to write explicitly the, the cross-section in, in an analytic form of, for all the kinematic variables that we are interested in. Having this uh, analytic expression for the cross-section allows us also, of course, to have the analytic expression for the likelihood ratio as a function of all the variables. And one starting point, one starting check that we can do to compare, to see whether the training was effective is just to compare the true versus the reconstructed PDF ratio. And you can see it in this plot, the x-axis is the reconstructed PDF ratio, while the y-axis is the true one. And you can see that the simple classifier has learned roughly this uh, distribution and the quadratic classifier has learned it much better. You can see that the spread over this diagonal is much smaller. There is still some spread here, but this spread can be eliminated as I was saying in the beginning by increasing the number of training points and by making the network more complex. Now this test here is only qualitative, meaning that it doesn't tell us how well this network can actually uh, understand and see new physics. So to see this, what we, do, what we did is we exploited the Norman Pearson lemma. This lemma is telling us that uh, the log likelihood ratio is the optimal test statistics, optimal meaning that for a fixed significance, it maximizes the power of the statistical test between two hypotheses. This is how this test statistic looks like. And you can see that in, test, in these test statistics, the tau function that we are learning with the PTF enters, with the, sorry, with the neural network enters. So exploiting this Norman Pearson lemma allows us to define a notion of optimality. And so we can objectively compare the optimal bound that is obtained by using the true PTF ratio here in this formula compared to the one that the network is learning. So this is the result, this is what we find. So the red bar is this Norman Pearson uh, uh, bound. So it's using the, the analytic uh, expression that we found for the likelihood ratio. And so this is mathematically the best possible bound that you can find on these operators. And you can see that the yellow bar, this is the quadratic classifier, is really close to, to the red bar. So this means that our method is nearly optimal. There is a little bit of gap in this uh, GW plot here, but as I was saying before, you can shorten this gap by increasing the number of points that you use for training and, to, and by making the network more complex. Also in this plot, you can see this blue bar. This blue bar is, some, is a standard bin analysis in which you are binning on one or two uh, potentially discriminating observables. And you see that especially in the GW case, we Using the neural network approach, we gain a factor two of reach in these operators compared to the bind analysis. Now, this was for the toy data, so generated from our little Monte Carlo, but then we repeated the same analysis also from on events that are generating with MATGRAPH. We did it both for leading order MATGRAPH and for next to leading order MATGRAPH, showered with PITIA. And you can see that the results are quite striking. For example, the neural network reach is stable and it doesn't change very much even if you are increasing the complexity of the data that the neural network is learning from. While the tests like this matrix element test are already ineffective at the leading order level. This is mostly because of the neutrino reconstruction that changes a little bit the kinematics and so the matrix element is no longer 
optimal, an optimal test in this case. And the situation gets even worse at the uh, next leading order where both the beginning analysis and the matrix element test are completely ineffective while the neural network is uh, rich is still uh, basically the same as it was in the toy case. So this brings me to the conclusions. I've tried to convince you that multivariate analysis can greatly increase the sensitivity on the understanding of the parameters. And especially if there are some uh, physical examples in which there can be some complicated interference pattern among all the kinematics uh, variables that are interesting, that are entering in the process. And so this is something that we should aim to use as much as possible to, to have more precise to for precision studies at LEC. I also told you that standard analysis methods cannot handle this kind of multivariate analysis while also being systematical and easily improvable. On the other hand, the machine learning method that I just presented can overcome all these difficult difficulties since the same algorithm, the same neural network can be used in all the cases I've showed you. So we have, maybe I didn't stress it enough, but both for the toy example, the multiple feeding order and the maximum next to leading order, we are using the same network architecture and the same number of training point size. So it's just a matter of, if you want pressing a simple button and the, and the analysis happens without the need of redesigning everything from scratch, starting from the, depending on which process you're studying. Also, this uh, novelty of uh, embedding this quadratic functional dependence in the loss enables a more accurate uh, reconstruction of the PDF ratio in the Wilson coefficient parameter space. In the example I showed you now, I've only talked about one Wilson coefficient, but the generalization to more Wilson coefficient is trivial. And at last, some word about what we're, what we're doing right now. We are generalizing this method to also be able to handle PDF uncertainties that can be parameterized in a similar way in which we are doing this parameterization in the Wilson coefficients. And uh, in the next paper, we will also add detector effects and see what are the impacts of this uh, in this kind of data analysis. And I'm done, so thank you very much. Thank you, Alfredo. Uh, do we have any questions from the room? We have one question. Okay. Yes, thank you for the interesting study. So, um, uh, if I understood correctly, you uh, uh, one of the in terms of fitting side, uh, you would actually fit uh, your machine learning uh, results like event by event, right? Then you compare with the uh, uh, bin results from the traditional methods. Uh, was was that uh, correct understanding? So, um, so the, the way the training works is that you generate two. So I let's talk about just the simple case because it's easier to understand. Which you generate a giant Monte Carlo sample for the standard model and a giant Monte Carlo sample for BSM. And then you train using this loss that is summing over event by event on these two samples here. Yeah, uh, I, I meant for the eventual uh, cons uh, constraint on the uh, e EFT coefficients, uh, your likelihood function actually was based on event by event uh, construction, right? So, so you mean for the, the, the way in which we extract the, the reach? So the way in which we extract the reach is that we use this formula here that yes, is summed over a, a, a sample of events. And you basically want to build these two curves one for one hypothesis and one for the presumptive sample model, one for the BSM one. And we are looking for the point at which this separation is the is a two sigmas. Mm -hmm. But yes, it's done. This test statistic is computing a finite sample, if you want, of events, mm -hmm. event by event. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, have you, sorry, uh, maybe final questions. Have you tried to improve your traditional method, which you showed using BINT method? But also try, um, also try to use machine learning uh, for that uh, case. The, the thing is that the machine learning. So when you do beans, 
you are basically approximating part of the full likelihood. But uh, like if you want integrating over some of the variables and approximating it, uh, if you want as a step function. What the machine learning is doing it doing is fitting the full likelihood over the full space of parameters. So uh, improving the bin analysis with machine learning doesn't seem particularly useful, meaning that the machine learning itself is already doing the, the mm -hmm. most that you can do. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. We have a couple of questions here uh, from online as well. I think I saw Gutierrez's hand go up first. So go ahead, Gutierrez. Sure. Uh, yeah, my question is that, uh, so you have basically a two separate uh, neural network for the linear and quadratic uh, contributions. So yes. th does it mean that you could easily um, adapt your method to uh, define uh, an analysis that would be mostly sensitive to a linear term that would be, I mean, that you could tune things to kind of reduce the quadratic sensitivity? I mean, at the, at the expense probably of loosening the bounds a bit, but maybe uh, that would be compensated by uh, an extended range of validity um, of the effective field theory. Uh, yeah, I guess that's so the, the parameterization that you are using now is explicitly quadratic, but you can also use uh, a linear parameterization in the, in the width of coefficient space. This kind of parameterization trick uh, like you can yep. use whatever functional form you want. Yeah, but if you only optimize on the linear part, uh, you may still pick up uh, high quadratic sensitivity. You could also try to suppress the quadratic sensitivity, treat the quadratic as a kind of a background also. So, uh, maybe, can, can I go it on that? Oh, yes. Uh, okay, uh, Andrew. Yeah, Andrew. not getting so. We get right. so with our training, uh, we fit uh, what the Monte Carlo gives. So, if the Monte Carlo we set it to give us the quadratic term, uh, we will have to use uh, two neural networks because that's the most what the that's what is needed to fit the output of the Monte Carlo. Once we have these neural networks, we can simply turn one of the two off or expand to the quadratic or to the linear order as much as we want. You can say so. Once we have done the learning, uh, once you have learned the two, once you have learned the distal function then uh, we have independently access to the linear and to the quadratic term. So if you want to do your analysis, uh, which only relies on uh, the uh, linear term, uh, you want to, be, to use a classifier um, for the final data analysis, you can ignore the quadratic term. But uh, when you learn it from the Monte Carlo, there is no need of changing anything. You learn from a Monte Carlo that contains the quadratic term, and then you will uh, use two neural networks to fit. If sure. you learn from Monte Carlo that only contains the linear term, then uh, you will have to modify that formula. But uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my question a bit more specifically, instead of ignoring the quadratic term, would be, could you uh, design an analysis that would suppress its contribution? Since you've basically parameterized its dependence. I, mean, uh, I wouldn't see the, uh, the reason for doing that, but... Uh, for sure. I mean, I mean, for, for instance, uh, I mean, it's very... Simply, you could uh, uh, you could obtain a, a discriminant eventually that uh, suppresses the tail uh, because the tail would uh, increase the quadratic sensitivity and would focus in the bulk of the distribution on some kind of angular uh, and uh, some angular distribution instead. But but if but if you don't suppress the, the tail, you you may still pick up. Uh, uh, significant quadratic sensitivity. You see, I think it would solve anything because if you cannot trust the quadratic term, uh, you simply don't have to go in the region, the medical region where this is important, right? Because so you just cut it out. In any case, your, your your projection will be wrong. So even if I don't think it can be solved by. Oh, maybe I can have more comment on this. So maybe Cotier, what he has in mind is to uh, use the the. the Linear and quadratic dependence may be to pick up regions of the parameter of the kinematic space where the quadratic terms are less relevant with respect to the linear ones. For instance, there could be some regions in the kinematic space in which the linear dependence is enhanced. Okay, and picking up those regions 
maybe you can suppress the, uh, the quadratic sensitivity. But this, uh, in principle, is doable once, uh, because the neural network, what gives you is the full dependence on theta, okay, linear, quadratic, and, uh, whatever, if you want also higher uh, terms in some cases. So then you can study this function in the parameter space and understand if there are regions in which you believe that uh, you can uh, extract more easily the linear sensitivity with respect to the quadratic or whatever. So this is possible. What they did, so the neural network gives the, the full dependence and then you can use it uh, as you want. So you can even have an, an additional step in optimizing, uh, for instance, by hand or some other methods uh, depending on the dependence point by point in the kinematic space. Yeah. Sounds, sounds like a topic that I would love to see uh, expanded upon in the Slack. So uh, I encourage you guys to, to sign up and, and continue this discussion there, Guti. Maybe if you can briefly phrase your question in Alfredo's channel, that would be a great place to continue. Now, in the interest of time, uh, I'd like to allow uh, at least one more brief question. I think Ramona was, uh, was there after Guti. Okay, um, so I wanted to understand a little bit better on how, what do you mean by can be systematically improved where you were, for instance, in particular on the slide where you were showing the comparison between the matrix element method and so on. So basically, do you, um, so for instance, you were also showing the one where you go to next to leading order. So systematically improving for you then means that you have to retrain your, your network if you, if you go to next to leading order with respect to leading order or? So yes, so every time you, so for, this, so for these three scenarios, of course, we have used three different neural nets to train every time because okay. uh, you need to training on the same data that then you're going to, going to test if you want. And instead, if they, in the matrix element method, what, what happens when going from leading order to next to leading order? Like this transfer matrix will change somehow. So I'm not an expert in matrix element method. So the way we used it in the paper, we are, we've used it in a really naive way because so uh, we, are, we are studying only a leptonic process. So showering doesn't affect too much. So basically what we're using as a matrix element as statistics is simply the differential cross section that we have computed in the simplified scenario. So the one that we can compute if you want analytically by hand. So at leading order, what happens is that uh, uh, when you get the matrix data, you need to reconstruct them in the neutrino momentum. And this changes a little bit the actual distribution in, of the various kinematic variables. And this becomes different from what the simple matrix element uh, was expecting. And so this is why you lose sensitivity there. But the neural network is able to, to learn everything. Mm -hmm. So that's why the neural network doesn't lose sensitivity here. Also in this plot, I see kind of some shades when you go to next leading order, what do they? What yes, do they... so this is, uh, so basically to do this Norman Pearson test, you need to reconstruct these uh, two curves, these two distribution for this T variable. And since you do it with a finite number of points, there is some uh, uh, statistical error in the reconstruction, for example, of the moment, if you want, if you have the moment of these distributions. So this shading here is just the, the error of the bound. Okay. So it's some statistical fluctuation that can happen. So the, the, the darkest part you want is the central value and then it's up or down one sigma in this kind of uncertainty. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to curtail the live discussion at this point because actually our local participants have a very narrow window in which they now have to go for dinner. So I saw that there were questions from Jacko and Rick. Um, so I would invite you to please um, sign up to the Slack and ask them there, or uh, perhaps if the speakers are, are willing to join uh, the Wonder for us online participants, uh, for which it's not yet dinner time, we can also uh, continue uh, some, some questions there if, if you want. But, uh, but Slack is always good because then everybody else can, can see the questions and also uh, give their own uh, perspectives. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I should thank uh, all the speakers then, uh, as well as Alfredo, uh, for, for the session. Uh, we basically managed to finish almost on time. Uh, so, uh, Shuang Yong, do, you, do the organizers want to say anything about uh, the next session? 
Uh, no, no, not not much. Actually, let's thank all the speaker again. Yeah, thanks very much, guys. So, so the next session is uh, in in how much time? I've lost the uh, timetable. One and a half hours, something like that. One and a half.